So everybody, good morning um, or evening or afternoon, depending on where you are. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to the um, API lifecycle stage. And first we are going to hear from Alexei and he is going to talk to us about API design where culture and tech meet. So I am going to move that, uh, pass it on to him now. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Hello, Luana. Thank you for introducing me. Um, yeah, shall we already start? Or oh, okay, uh, okay. That's the next. And um, I'm so happy that uh, you joined us today. And I apologize in advance if my kids will go into this room because you know we're all in these times working from home, so it becomes quite normal. But still, I hope this will not happen today. Um, and uh, let me. The next end. Can you see my screen? Can you see my screen? Yes, yes, okay. Okay, very good. Um, thanks again. So let's talk today about API design and let's see uh, where culture and tech meet, meet each other when it comes to API design. So. My name is Alexei. I work for Adyen for almost five years, and today I'll share some insights on how we do API governance and design. It might be useful for somebody in a similar position or focusing on similar efforts, as well as for all developers who work on creating public facing APIs. First of all, let me quickly introduce myself and then move on to more important stuff. Basically, I got my master's and started my career in software engineering, then switched to technical communication had experience working in a startup and scale up and was leading different teams and now responsible for API strategy, API governance, API design, and everything else that leads to great developer experience. If you want to contact me, you can always find me on Twitter and LinkedIn. And besides software engineering, I was studying linguistics. And so my background helps me find some interesting angles in how we look and design APIs as well. We all know what APIs stands for. So it's application programming interface. And that's the interface part, which is often overlooked, while interface is what enables interaction. So basically, in that sense, if we think about this, API is a formal language that we expect our programs to use to talk to each other. And ironically, at the same time, there are always people behind these machines. So some people create this communication language, and some use it to teach their programs how to talk to your applications. And this is just one of the examples where tech and culture of human beings can meet each other in the API world. Today, we'll be looking uh, at the Adyen use case. So let me also quickly introduce what we do to understand how it impacts uh, the API challenge that, that we have. API is a global fintech company. Uh, we do payment processing and provide uh, some other financial services. We support more than 200 different payment methods all over the world. We are operating globally. We started in Europe, but also expanding quickly and provide services all over the world now. And uh, we're observing a fantastic growth of our platform. So uh, basically, it's exponential. And even in these challenging times, we're able to scale up and support businesses all over the world to overcome the COVID crisis. If you also think about the complexity of our APIs, uh, we can quickly look at the number of different companies, different businesses uh, that we are serving. And of course, this means that this can be very different challenges, very different needs, and also different channels, e com mobile, and point of sale. So basically, to summarize what API means for us, API is our bread and butter of our business. So in this case, we're a single platform, and this is our conscious choice, uh, to provide unified commerce and other benefits of being a single platform. 
And at the same time, APIs is what really makes our system interconnected internally. It what helps us to connect to different payments providers and schemes. And also this is how our customers connect to us. So basically we have APIs everywhere. And uh, to think about the landscape of this whole platform so that uh, you can easily imagine what's going on. We have dozens of public APIs. We have thousands of internal APIs um, working under the hood. We provide these APIs on multiple channels, as I explained. We have web, mobile, internal APIs, other devices connected through that. Um, we have hundreds of thousands of API calls every minute. And of course, this number also can depend on um, is it maybe Black Friday or something else going on. But uh, the amount of API calls is really enormous. And then we have private cloud distributed across multiple regions. If you think about the impact and the responsibility, what we are creating with our APIs is more than uh, 300 billion processed last year. And uh, we're still growing. And all this should be available 24 7. So basically, this means that we have quite some challenges. Uh, and these challenges can be related to technology, to security, to scalability, availability, and all the other topics that usually such an enormous platform can face. So you might imagine that um, API management is quite complicated with such a platform. And if we maybe mention some things here, uh, first of all, it's availability of the platform. So all our API decisions, the way how we design, the way how we deploy, the way how we maintain, it should always take into account that payments should never stop. So basically, we always provide access to our platform. Then, of course, it means that um, we are existing from 2006. And there is a lot of uh, decisions that we made in the past and a lot of businesses that um, uh, use us on a daily basis. So we really want to make sure that with every decision, uh, we uh, don't break existing integration. Basically, it's a lot of responsibility for that. At the same time, if you look at how we want to work, how we um, work in our software development groups, we really appreciate freedom and we really appreciate autonomous teams, which means that many teams, uh, they're quite independent, they're multidisciplinary, they own technical and business decisions from A to Z, and they want to move fast. And you can imagine that in this situation, API governance is really a challenge. Uh, what's also interesting about API governance is that in the recent Gartner research, uh, the first item that you can see here on the screen is that API governance should never create a bottleneck. Uh, because in this case, uh, yeah, a, a lot of things can happen. So some teams might start ignoring your API governance decisions. Some teams might be, might be slowed down by you not able to make decisions as fast or decisions making fast, but not efficient and scalable in the future, you will need to uh, change it, which also leads uh, to a lot of problems. So basically, this is what we are trying to avo uh, avoid. And um, what we also noticed that one important thing that we should always take into account when we think about API governance is that API decisions are never purely technical or non-technical. So there is always an, uh, one aspect of technical side in every decision or every process and uh, non-technical side as well, which uh, usually is referred as cultural aspect. In our case, um, we really want to focus how we are embedding API design into the company culture. And uh, company culture is, uh, uh, there are a lot of things how you can define the company culture. And uh, I like this definition is the culture is how we do things here. It's how, how we create new products, how we write, how we test and deploy our code, what we use and when. Basically, a lot of things like company culture a lot of processes are usually already engraved in the organization, but it's not the organization itself, it's people, right? It's, it's your colleagues. So this is how we do things here. So you cannot just uh, come and introduce a new process and say, okay, now we do API governance or API design, this is how we do things differently. So this is constantly a challenge also for you, in addition to a technical challenge, if you're in a similar position. And uh, what's different at Adyen is that uh, we, uh, have something that we call our way of engineering. So basically, this is also where we try to find key areas and to formulate things and ideas that we follow when we develop and evolve our platform. And uh, this is something that we follow on a daily basis 
when we work on our platform. And here, for example, I want to focus on some things that I mentioned that our teams are really independent. So in this case, uh, in every team, uh, every engineer feels responsible for many aspects of the product, of the code that they write. We are all designers, architects, and coders, as you see here. And the API design, of course, is part of that responsibility. At the same time, it's usually the team that really owns where and how your code goes live. So, and we see that this is a very positive element of how we develop our code because this means all the freedom and autonomy, which empowers people to make decisions and to move fast, which is really good. At the same time, as I mentioned, API decisions are really complex and impactful. First of all, uh, a lot of times what we see when we need to design how the API should look like, especially in the case of a public API, uh, it really requires a diverse knowledge. It's a knowledge about uh, the architecture of your platform, the architecture of your APIs, also how other APIs are made, but also about the use cases. It's a, uh, a lot of product knowledge, a lot of business knowledge and payment knowledge. So you really need to involve multiple people to make this decision. And uh, usually not all these people are already in the team that is working on this API. At the same time, as I mentioned, this API should be made fast and the decision should be made fast to make sure that um, we follow all the steps properly and can be developing nice, cool products altogether. And the last point is the definition of done for public API. So basically we uh, notice that it's really important to distinguish between a moment when we're still working on this new version of API and hashing out all the ideas and details based on the feedback, and we can still experiment and do the reviews. And the moment when merchants on our customers really start using the API, because this is the API is already done. It's in production. It's been used by somebody. Of course, later you can still evolve the API. You can use versioning or evolve without versioning. But this also means that somebody is already relying on that, is using that, and probably will never move from that version. Uh, that's also a lot of responsibility in how to make API decisions fast. Uh, so basically, how do you successfully launch uh, API governance in existing organization with existing culture and existing processes? And of course, for everybody, it can be different. In our case, uh, we learned uh, some things that I want to share. Basically, first of all, what we realized that you need to start with a group of people who are enthusiastic about API design, who are willing to dedicate their time to API reviews, API governance efforts. And ideally, you should be looking for a diverse group representing different parts of your platform and your business. This group, is, in our case, is mostly responsible for three main efforts. First of all, API design and API ideation and feedback should start before you start the actual development of your API. Then API reviews. API reviews uh, usually happen in when new teams are working on new APIs and they bring something to your team, or it can also happen that you already have an existing product and want to improve something in these APIs and uh, just want to brainstorm all together. And uh, of course, uh, this group should be responsible for the style guide and tools that increase um, uh, consistency and also drive API to adoption. For uh, doing the API reviews, we noticed that it's really important that all the people uh, come to the same room, but also can do these reviews asynchronously and also in a visual way. And of course, there are multiple tools how we can uh, review APIs. Postman, for example, is one of the examples of the great tools. Uh, we chose Stoplight, which provides a visual UI for uh, representing your API and also you can provide a lot of examples of different use cases and uh, test a lot of things and collaborate because it's connecting to the uh, Git uh, repository. So basically, uh, Stoplight uh, works pretty well for us in this case. And I definitely recommend you, if you're thinking about uh, API review processes, uh, implement some of these tools uh, in your process and organization. Of course, uh, during the API reviews, uh, you're making a lot of decisions and you don't want to make the decisions over and over. And it's logical that you need to have an API style guide uh, for your APIs. This can be also different for your internal APIs or public APIs, or maybe also for different classes of the APIs that you have. You can choose to use one of the existing style guides um, that are open sourced on the internet, for example, or you can create your own style guide if there is a need for that. I think the key components and key factors for a style guide to be successful is to make sure that it's easily accessible to everyone in the organization. Basically, it should be somewhere on a common place where all the people in your company use it and uh, they can easily see, okay, this is what's happening. Um, 
it's also a key that everyone in your organization can contribute to this style guide in one way or another. Of course, you want probably to have more control uh, of the uh, style guide to yourself, but at the same time, it should be really open uh, for more collaboration because otherwise it becomes really stale and uh, difficult to maintain. Also, it's good if in a style guide you explain not only what um, it's good or incorrect to do, but also why, what's the reason for that, maybe links to different uh, external resources and maybe still leave some discussion points, for example, that some people might disagree and in the future come to you back and then uh, you can have a discussion if you want to change something in the style guide. And uh, last but not least, it's important that style guide is something that you can consistently maintain and evolve. So it's important that you evaluate what you have and improve um, the language and the rules and expand on the uh, weekly basis, basically. Of course, style guide is great. At the same time, it can be very long. So not everybody can know this, and especially for developers um, who probably want to focus more on the coding part, uh, reading the whole style guide and memorizing all the things. It also can be a challenge. So uh, there are, of course, a lot of tools how you enforce style guide. And one of them that we found uh, very useful is uh, to use Spectral, where you can link and implement uh, any custom rules, basically, that you have in your style guide. And then if you use OpenAPI as a contract uh, for your API designs and API design decisions, so basically, this is a good solution. And uh, since I'm already talking about OpenAPIs, um, it's very uh, good if you start treating OpenAPI files as API contracts. You can use other uh, API contract definition in your organization, it depends, of course, on your stack, on what you have, and what's feasible. But OpenAPI uh, now is proven to be a very mature format for uh, defining any, uh, like most of the families of web HTTP APIs. And there will be more talks uh, at API days about OpenAPI, but basically my recommendation also to start using it in your organization, not only for documentation, while well, for documentation is already a great step, but also for uh, treating all the API designs as API contracts. In this case, you can also think about implementing contract testing. When, for example, you can see if API implementation is actually matching with what you have discussed and agreed and designed. And also this will help you to implement the design first process when you first design the APIs and then start implementing it. In our case, uh, sometimes we do the API design first, sometimes we still develop APIs and design them simultaneously, which also can be challenged, but uh, this is really to make sure that we can move fast with our API design, design decisions. Um, and uh, another aspect of uh, successful API um, evolution is actually to make sure that you have clear understanding of how you develop these APIs. Because, of course, uh, not all the API decisions are ideal. And sometimes we look back and say, OK, this is something we need to change. This means, of course, that we might want to introduce a new version of your APIs, or we can find ways to introduce uh, the change without a version. What's the key here is the shared understanding between all the internal teams, but also between the users of your API, especially if this is a public API, what you consider to be a breaking change and what you consider to be a non-breaking change. Because um, surprisingly, this understanding can be also very different. And that's why it's important to have such document in your API design and review process. Uh, I was focusing on things that can help us with uh, making sure that um, building APIs internally is uh, easy and also it can be uh, quickly adopted uh, by everyone in your organization. And uh, this was mostly focusing on the like acceptance and processes and culture side. At the same time, uh, my recommendation is also that you don't underestimate the value of good tooling. So in this case, what helps is that you analyze the whole process of API development from ideation to creation to testing and um, maintaining and then eventually maybe deprecating and try to understand why we have these bottlenecks. So in this case, if you can improve uh, tooling and frameworks, everything that you have in your organization and empower your developers, then of course, they will be also more supportive of all, all the API design initiatives. To summarize, basically, uh, we have API design. 
where collaboration is a key. And my recommendation is to use stop light, open API, API design first process, or API design as soon as possible process, as we call here. Uh, another is, of course, API development. So try to evaluate from A to Z the entire API lifecycle, try to automate and support as much as possible, remove bottlenecks, and help uh, everyone in the organization to create APIs, which will fit your API design vision. And also, what we did not touch today, uh, didn't have time for that, but uh, of course, it's important to look outside how your APIs are used, especially if you're creating public APIs. It's always important to understand how the customers of your APIs, how they interact with them. Uh, and of course, you can educate and make sure that you have um, documentation and all the tooling and examples that support people to use your APIs in the right way. At the same time, it's important to be in between your organization and your API consumers and also understand um, what are maybe the challenges and also try to see what's the expectations of your API consumers, what's their background, uh, what's their mindset, how they want to use your APIs and listen to this feedback and try to bring this back and improve. And here, one of the factors that we see that uh, developer relations, developer advocates team can be the key in your API design process. And this all should lead to great developer experience. And I want to finish today with this nice image showing Matryoshka dolls. Uh, basically, with API governance, you're stepping into a journey where you never know what's next. Sometimes you will be facing a technical challenge, but if you go deeper, you see that this is a problem that you need to solve on the culture side. And then again, understanding the next problem might lead you to a better technical solution, which can sometimes even turn the whole process upside down. I wish you good luck in this journey. And if you want to share your experience or talk more about this, please contact me at any time. Thank you. Thank you, Alexi. That was a really great talk. We have one question for you. Um, in your opinion, should we treat public and private APIs differently? Uh, that's a very good question. So from one side, as far as I remember in Jay's, uh, Jeff Bezos' manifesto, um, one of the ideas was that uh, you should always think when you build internal APIs, you should always think uh, how it can be externalized. And uh, this, of course, means that even internal APIs can be always, uh, built with this mindset. At the same time, it depends on, on the use cases, who is using your APIs, what kind of, um, I don't know, technology or technical stack they have. And uh, this also might uh, mean for you that you can split and you can apply different style guides, different design decisions in general, can uh, do things differently. And um, maybe on the contrary, uh, it also depends on your organization, how you operate, how, how your teams are um, interacting and building products all together. Because for example, in a big organization, um, one team is building a product and APIs, which can be seen as external um, respective to this team and other teams will be using this API. So in this case, there is no real big difference. Is it the API used within your organization or outside your organization? Thank you very much. Um, and I'm gonna move on to the next speaker, I guess, since we don't really have any other questions, if that's okay. Yes, thank you very much. Have a good day. Have, have a great conference. Have a great